hello, Steve Fletcher here and welcome to another little video log. Uh, today, I've been thinking about this for a little while actually, Pink Floyd, what a surprise. I don't think about Pink Floyd very often, as, uh, as you know. Obviously Pink Floyd are incredibly lucky because not only do they have me as one of the most uh, hugely over-the-top geeky Pink Floyd fans ever, they're also lucky enough to have, quite frankly, the most godliest of god guitarists in their lineup. Yeah, it can't be um, argued very far, really, that Gilmore is the greatest one of slash the greatest guitar player to ever take hold of this crazy little six strings piece of wood that we all love. Um, and so I thought I'd take a few little. Uh, stabs at trying to find instances where people, guitarists, other guitarists have stepped into Gilmore's shoes and tried to emulate, play like him and all that kind of stuff. Now, I could spend hours going through the reams and reams of Pink Floyd tribute bands that are out there, but I'm not going to. Um, my personal feeling on, on most of the Pink Floyd tribute bands is they're a little bit Dot, dot, dot. I'm just going to leave that there, actually. So, um, yeah, let's give you a little bit of history, um, because there has been a little bit of a, 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 a not very often told story of, of division within Pink Floyd. Now, those of you who don't know, uh, primary lyricist and general ideas man, Roger Waters, left Pink Floyd in 1985. Now, luckily for all of us, he didn't leave with very much... Um, you know, he didn't shout and make too much of a big deal out of it. He just sort of quietly slipped away, really. And no one really noticed. And, and, and Roger was really quiet about it. And, you know, there was no big news about it and nothing in the sort of Floyd canon that really made any difference to anything, quite frankly. It was almost like Roger just sort of faded away and no one really noticed. And what happened since, of course, is Roger has tried... Uh, well, he has uh, gone off and enjoyed a rather nice solo career. Um, his solo albums have probably not sold as well as he would like, um, but his live shows certainly do very well, which is probably due to the fact that he plays pretty much 99% Pink Floyd material. And there is a wonderful opportunity for us finickety, pickety, finickety, never happy with anything guitarists, well, this guitarist in particular, to do a nice little video log. So what Roger has done um, over his the years is he's got several guitarists in. He usually gets two, maybe three guitarists to step into the shoes of a certain Mr. Gilmore, which I find quite telling. Um, and they sort of come up with their own spin on things. It's quite hard up to a point because Roger's sort of up to about 2006... Roger kind of gave the guitarists in the band free will to uh, improvise their own style, you know, stamp their own feeling onto the Gilmore solos. Um, so it's a lot easier to, to sort of, not judge, but it's a lot easier to sort of, you know, rank your favourite different guitar players. It's harder post-2006 um, because what Roger started to insist on doing is that the, the Pink Floyd songs that he does in his set, which is, like I say, 99% of his set, he wanted them performing exactly like they are on the record. His reasoning for this, I do not know. So pretty much every guitarist that, Gil that Roger has had since 2006 has not been able to really show their own style, their own stamp on these solos because they have had to perform the solos exactly as they are on the record and that's a problem because how can you try to emulate one of the greatest guitar players of all time you, i don't think you can but anyway here is my list of times where rogers session musicians played david gilmore's solos better than david gilmore
OK, I'm being a little bit facetious, because, of course, there aren't any occasions where uh, one of Roger's session musicians has played a guitar solo better than David Gilmour. No offence to you guys. I'm not trying to stir the hornet's nest up. It just can't follow in God's footsteps. I'm sorry. That being said, I do have a little bit of a controversial one to go for, because my two favourite guitarists, lead guitarists, that Roger has had, the first one was he, a very short-lived member of Roger Waters' band, the Bleeding Heart Band, as Roger calls it, which was Rick DeFonzo. And he played uh, his most seen moment in Roger's band was... Um, the Berlin Wall in 1990. He's the main sort of Gilmore guitar player. Uh, not a lot of known, you know, not a lot was known about Rick DeFonzo before he sort of played in that thing. And the rumor is that he kind of uh, met Roger in the pub and said, "I could play guitar for you." And Roger said, "All right." That's kind of an internet urban legend, which I think might have to call BS on that one. But um, anyway. Uh, his sound on the wall concerts, it's really, really lovely. It's a nice, thick and creamy tone on his strats. He gets this really lovely sound. Um, he does play, and what he does is he he plays within the framework of the Gilmore solos and just embellishes it enough to be different, kind of like Gilmore does when he plays uh, the Gilmore solos. And in particular, I'm thinking of solos like Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, where, you know, he, he does and what Gilmore does. I mean, obviously, Gilmore never played that solo that's on the record ever again, which, again, why is Roger making the guitarists in the band play, in his band play them the same? But anyway, um, so, yeah, it's kind of... Um, he, he plays that solo in such a way that the essence of the original solo is there, but he does just take it to that next level. Not a better or worse, but just a comparable level of... of and you think, so yeah, he's done really well with that, actually. So, well done. So that's sort of my second favourite. Um, in fact, let me just jump back a little bit. My third favourite, I have to say, I have to give credit here to... Um, I can't really call him my third favourite. I have to give credit, though, to, to Snowy White for being sort of the almost ever-present guitar player in Roger's band... He doesn't play very many of Gilmore's solos because he's largely the sort of rhythm backup guitarist. I just love him as a guitar player, and he does play some absolutely fantastic stuff. And in particular, you know, we have to look at the Berlin Wall concert where he, his second solo, the second solo of Another Brick in the Wall. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I have to also give props for the solo, the guitar solo that he does in Nobody Home which doesn't exist on the original album, but it was put in on the Berlin 90 concerts. I was hoping it would be re-included when Roger resurrected the wall uh, in, the, in the, the 2010s, but it wasn't, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but yeah, I have to give props to Snowy White, for just being generally amazing. Um, and he also was the backup guitarist on my favourite Pink Floyd era, which is the Animals era. So I have to sort of also, so getting to sort of my absolute favourite of, of Roger's backup, replacement session guitarist. Bit of a divisive one. I've seen as much praise for this guitarist as I have grumbles. Um, and it's Doyle Bramall II who performed with Roger on the In The Flesh DVD. He was the main guitarist for Roger's band when Roger sort of re-emerged in live music life in the sort of late 90s, early noughties. I happen to love Doyle Bramall II as a guitarist Anyway, anyone who loves that sort of not 12-bar blues, that sort of progressive rock blues kind of feel to their music would do good to check out Doyle Bramall's Welcome album. It's got some amazing guitar stuff on it, some brilliant songs on it. So I knew Doyle Bramall anyway. And so for me, it was quite a treat when I bought the DVD, it was oh my God, that's Doyle Bramall. I didn't know. And again, what he does is he plays the solos. I'm thinking of, again, another Brick in the Wall Part 2. Dogs, in particular, he does really, really well. 
uh, and the comfortably numb solo and, and all that kind of stuff. He plays those solos within that style of Gilmore. And again, just reaching that little bit away to stamp his own personality on them. And I love it. I think he did really, really well. The guitar tone, his guitar tone as well is really lovely. It's really thick. It's really creamy. It does a really nice job. I think the thing that divides people with Doyle Bramall the second is he obviously comes from that Texas blues vein, which he does let it out a little bit. There's a the, Roger does an arrangement of Shine On, and I can get on board with it. It doesn't bother me at all, but I can see why people would get bothered about it. Is Roger does a good version of Shine On, actually, on the In the Flesh DVD, and he kind of does a hybrid mash of the two halves of Shine On. And in the middle, where Gilmore would normally do his slide solo, you kind of get this sort of free-for-all jam in that Shine On vein, where, where Snowy and Doyle, first names, like I know them, have their own little moment to shine. And, yeah, Bramall does let the Texas blues out a little bit on Shine On, and I can see why people might be a little bit... Like, mm, that doesn't really fit the progressive music stand. I, like I say, though, I, because I knew Doyle Bramall anyway, um, I, I knew what to expect, so it didn't really bother me. And I have to say, I think his version of Dogs is quite possibly the best version of Dogs, the live, officially released live version of Dogs. Um... Kind of by default, actually, I have to say. I'm being a bit cheeky, cheeky, cheating a little bit um, because it's the only, at that point, it was the only live version of Dogs officially released. Comfortably numb as well on that In the Flesh DVD and on the Berlin Wall Night. They, they do this great guitar duet, and I have to give props to Roger for having this. I don't know if it was Roger's idea. I'm giving props to Roger where maybe he doesn't deserve them. Of doing comfortably numb rather than saying, well, let's just try and be David Gilmore. Let's do something different with it. And he does give both guitarists a time to shine. So you've got Rick DeFonso and Snowy White in the wall, and you've got Doyle Bramall and Snowy White on the In the Flesh DVD giving this guitar duet, which ends in this lovely guitar harmony part in uh, In the Flesh, which I really, really, really end. So there you go, boys and girls. Um, obviously, no one can play guitar as good as David Gilmore, but a few have come pretty darn close, and that's my list. I would love to hear from you. Please comment your thoughts and feelings on this matter. Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and we'll see you next time, boys and girls. Bye-bye.